Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of our three webinars on spring killers in livestock presented to you by Northern Tablelands Local Land Services. My name is Tani Manton, and I am a livestock officer with Northern Tablelands LLS, based in Glen Ennis and covering the entire Northern Tablelands region. Our topic for this evening is bloat in sheep and cattle. Before we get the webinar underway, uh, we just go through a little bit of housekeeping. So there, there is a control panel that should be uh, in the top right hand corner of your screen. Uh, there is a red arrow button uh, to the left, which collapses and reinstates the control panel. You should hear us, but we cannot hear you. And as we go through the presentation tonight, please type your questions in to the box provided and I will relay uh, those questions to our panellists throughout the course of the webinar. Uh, we're going to run this webinar in a more relaxed uh, conversation uh, style rather than a formal presentation. So please get those questions through to us. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available to you in the coming days. There is also a handout, uh, which is a fact sheet on bloat in sheep and cattle uh, from New South Wales DPI for further information that you can download at any time through throughout this presentation tonight. So tonight's presenters are Dr. Nigel Brown. Nigel is the district vet with Northern Tablelands Local Land Services based in Glen Ennis. And we also have with us Georgie Oakes. Georgie is an agronomist with Northern Tablelands LLS based in Inverell. So before we actually get our webinar started, I'm just going to put up a quick poll, uh, which uh, you should be able to see on your screen there now. So we just uh, we just like to know: Have you had bloat so far this season? So I'll leave that open for uh, for a little bit. Um, we'll get some answers, and we can um, I can just relay them to our panelists. So I'll leave it open for about ten more seconds. Uh, and closing in three, two, one. Okay, so uh, we've had 26% 20, uh, of attendees have had bloat so far this season and 74% haven't. So, uh, We'll get uh, we'll get into it now. Firstly, Nigel, if we can start with you, if we can just just get right back to the basics and and what is bloat. Thanks, uh, Tani. Good evening, everybody. So, um, bloat is basically a buildup of gas in the rumen of uh, ruminants, cattle, sheep, goats uh, that causes sickness and highly likely to cause death. Simple okay. As that. So, okay, great. So, what about how how we can recognise bloat? How can people recognise it? So, uh, the pictures that we're looking at here at the moment show um, that 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 black beastie with a very full rumen bulging on the left hand side of the um, of the abdomen. The uh, picture uh, below the white one is 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 a cross picture of a of a sheep there also showing a lot of bulging there on the left hand side and if you go to the next slide which is there you'll be able to see what i mean with regard to the anatomy of the of the beasties so a normal room in that's the the picture with the sort of bright green stripe through the middle always has a bit of gas on it why quite simply because the rumen functions by um, fermenting material all those microbes bacteria protozoa goodness knows what else they produce gas you get really lush fodder in there that digests very easily the amount of gas goes up and 
it can't be belched out as is the norm because there is just so much. And, and on the left of that little diagram, you'll see that's where the esophagus goes up. And if you get too much gas, which rises to the top, as anybody that's drunk beer or champagne will know, the bubbles rise upwards and they sit on the top and they put a kink around where that esophagus is coming out. So it effectively works as a valve, stops the gas belching out, and the pressure just builds up. Okay, so Nigel, you, you've mentioned that, um, that there's feed that goes into the room and that's, that's highly digestible and highly fermentable. Georgie, if I can aim the next question at you, what are some of those features then of pastures that can lead to causing bloat? Yeah, Tani, so I guess as Nigel was saying, suggested the rapid digestibility, uh, we look at those pastures that are rapidly growing. So we've come into spring, we've got our pastures really jumping out of the ground. We've had a great start to the season which has been a blessing. Um, they're still in the vegetative stage, so they haven't started to shoot or boot, so that we're not seeing any flowers coming on um, when they're quite lot, um, high digestible. Um, and there's not much dry matter, so uh, I'm thinking over the winter we've probably eaten a lot of the dry matter that may have been left over from last summer, um, and then we've got all these green shoots coming through or whole new plants um, starting to come out. So there's no dry matter, really high digestible, they're growing rapidly um, and therefore they seem to be what, as Nigel mentioned, creating all the gases in the tummy. As you can see on the screen there, um, the relationship between the maturity of the plant and its digestibility. Um, if you'll see on the digestibility um, there on the axis, you'll when they're short, active, really growing, they're really high, highly digestible. And that's what we generally target because we are wanting to put meat on bones or grow wool. So we're, we're targeting this highly high energy, but then the high de digestibility, but that's where you start to run into your high risk zone. So if you start to wait and move down, um, down that curve, late vegetative and green or early flowering, you just start to reduce that digestibility. Um, your lignin on your plant starts to, the, the cell walls start to develop and become a little bit thicker. Um, and therefore it does just slow it down, uh, seems to slow it down a little bit more and you start to, reduce the risk as you go further um, down that curve. Thanks, Georgia. And, and often it, it's been said that we have our cattle living on the edge, if you like, when uh, when we get bloat in them and we can probably see why looking at that, looking at that um, relationship between digestibility and maturity of those pastures. So Georgia, another question for you, is this year what you would consider a high risk year for bloat? Um, yes and no. We've had a really good start to the season. So we have seen what we would call our high risk um, species. So lucerne and your white clovers, sub clovers. Um, but then our young rapidly growing grasses are still our high risk um, as well. So yes, we've seen a good change to the season. We did have a pretty good season last year. Last year, so I, I'm hoping there are some dry grasses left over from the end of last summer that may be able to help counteract this living life on the edge. Um, so yes, we are still high risk though, because we're still recovering from the past drought that we've just come out of um, and maybe the bushfire as well. So we are seeing a lot of clovers about at the moment. Um, I would think on our eastern side, we're probably just still getting into that at the moment because uh, we, from what I understand, we had some snow on our eastern fall. Um, so that may have slowed it up, that rapid growth. <laughs> but you can get those uh, 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 flushes anywhere throughout the season. Like As I just said, we've had a really good start to the season. It got warm quite early um, and then it, it's chilled a little bit and we've had some some frosts hit, we maybe had some a, a few low overnight lows um, and that would have slowed up the grasses a little bit. But in saying that, that's probably possibly going to draw the season out a little bit longer as well because we won't hit our flowering point for a little while yet. And that's our turning point um, from when we're starting to see high risk or low risk pastures. So you mentioned a few pastures there, Georgie, that um, may lead to bloat occurring. 
Uh, is there anything else like you mentioned, white clover, um, some brassicas, anything else? To be honest, anything that is young and rapidly growing, it can pose the risk. Uh, so I guess, how do you know? Um, take a really good drive throughout your paddocks regularly, um, maybe not daily, but at least weekly, mate, because you can have patches of clover pop up. You know that your soils are like a checkerboard across your paddocks. You could have um, patches of brassica thicker than somewhere else. There may be a nutrient like a poo pile um, from a cattle camp or a sheep camp where you'll have higher, higher rates and higher growth. So may, making sure you know the consistency of what species are through your paddocks can be helpful. Um, and maybe stepping off the bike or the buggy or the ute and just really have a look at the, the growth stage that's in the plant. You don't have to dissect every plant, but um, going off that chart that's on the screen there that you can see, you can see where we start to fall um, into the safer zone when we start to get that late vegetative and possibly some booting or you'll see some, some flower heads forming. Um, and they, they generally suggest that once flowers heads are forming, um, you can consider that to be safer. So that, I guess, leads us into um, some prevention, if you like, uh, of bloat and talking about prevention on pastures to wait until they are a little more mature, if possible. Yes, I would. Um, but it also, um, just the same old saying that we've say, suggest about if you, you're moving stock onto a new pasture, you, you would wait, um, maybe till the afternoon, um, make sure that they've had really good gut fill um, and they're not like kids in a lolly shop when they get moved on to the lush green fresh pasture. Um, they also suggest to wait um, till after the dew has lifted. Uh, they're suggesting um, the dew's lifted, it, it doesn't seem to be as highly digestible, um, maybe something else and, and maybe leave them access to a paddock. Um, you might have a dry paddock of standing feed next door, native grasses or something like that, that um, they seem to be fairly smart to know when they've had a little too much and, and they, will, they will start to look for the roughage as well. So making sure that they still have access uh, to, to dry roughage. And if you don't have access to a paddock like that, um, consider definitely supplying it, whether it's a hay or, or some sort of roughage that you take to the paddock for them. Okay, so there's a, there's a question here. Um, so um, digestibil digestibility of grasses, so obviously the higher, more digestible those grasses are, the more issues we'll have with, with bloat. Higher risk, I would say, yeah. Yep. It's okay. hard because we target those high, high risk grasses because they're what put feet on bones. Um, so I guess that's where you have to, as a producer, know where your balance is at. And I know the current prices at the moment, we probably don't want to be and the animal welfare is always a definite consideration, but we probably don't want to be blowing too many. Okay, so Nigel, let, I'm, I'm, I'll direct the next question at you. If we're talking about prevention uh, from, a, from a livestock point of view, what are some of those things we can do to help prevent bloat in livestock? Well, I think we, we have to go back a step first. Uh, they're tiny. I think we have to identify what are the animals that are most likely to be at risk from all the ones that we have. A and there are certainly some differences between sheep and, and cattle in this part of the world. I, I, I've seen a lot of bloat in, in the UK in sheep, but over here not so much. Um, and it, Bos taurus animals do seem to be more likely to get it than Bos indicus cattle. And younger animals seem to be more likely to get it than older animals. Partly, as, as Georgie was indicating, possibly because we're trying to, these animals are growing, they're really wanting to get as much fodder into their belly as they can. And maybe the gluttons amongst them go straight in for all this lush, juicy stuff. They haven't, they haven't learned that they ought to actually uh, have something a little bit more fibrous in to keep everything more stable. So I think it really is a question of highlighting those issues. I, I think also it, it's very important to make certain that we understand what the, is causing the problem with, with 
with these animals. Because if you go back to that previous slide from those lovely pictures of cows with bloat, there's a diagram there which shows lots of different swellings on main, these are from cattle, from cattle's abdomens, that bottom right hand corner there. And the black shaded area shows you the swelling out of the normal. And everything from pregnancy through to uh, paralyzed guts and all sorts of things can all cause subtly different swellings, which have often been described as bloat to me and other vets by producers. And, and so also you've got to remember that there are other things that will cause sudden death because many times you don't even see the animals swollen. Uh, there are other things like the clostridias, the pulpy kidneys, and um, even with the changeable weather, you can get things like uh, the nitrate, nitrite poisonings, etc., that will also cause sudden death. And so it's really important to make a diagnosis of what you're getting. Uh, sure, we, we're talking high risk. I mean, here we are, a quarter of the people, no, a third of the people that are here tonight have already had some blow problems. Um, but so we think prevention is vitally important, but you've got to focus on your pastures, which pastures are high risk, which category of animals are high risk and be certain of what you're doing. Be, if I may, because we don't know exactly the reason why you get bloat and George is alluded to proteins, but there are several different sorts of bloat. And you're going to ask me what, aren't you? Yes, probably. Yes. Thank you very much. Good. I just wanted to keep you in the conversation. I know I get carried away with these things. But but the main one that you get is frothy bloat, where which we've been talking about, where all these bubbles of gas form. But these bubbles are actually surrounded by a mixture of protein and fat. So they can't be belched out very well. And, and, and so what we're trying to do is to break down those bubbles. Now there are other forms of bloat you can get where animals can get a blockage in the throat so they can't block, belch out the food. They can get a feedlot bloat, not, in, not of the spring pastures, but if they're given that highly fermented carbohydrates, they can get a chronic bloat. So you've got to look at not just the, the animal that's sick or dead, but you've got to look at the others in the mob because there will be others in the mob that have got the same problem as well, almost certainly. I'll stop. Okay, we'll just, we'll, we'll go through a couple of questions here. Um, I'll, uh, this one's for you, Georgie. Is white clover safer once it has flowered? So uh, that is the suggestion. Uh, it's safer. I, I wouldn't say it's safe. Um, and we're going to look at that chart that I keep referring to. Um, once it's started to come out of its vegetative stage, it's then gone into flowering. And and for a plant, it's once it starts to flower, it starts to put a lot of its energy um, into the flower, therefore seeds. Uh, so you start to lose a lot of the energy into the leaf. And that's why we start to get the decline in the digestibility as it starts to mature. So I would suggest that the, the wording is full bloom or past bloom. So um, that that's the suggestion that you're starting to go into a safe zone. Um, but if they have come out of a dry grass paddock, native dry grass paddock with no clovers in it, I would still err on uh, caution because it the, the leaf of the clover is still quite highly digestible, um, making sure they're not hungry stock going into that paddock um, and that they do have good roughage still available. Um, and if it, like if they've got standing roughage in the paddock, like your dry haystack or some some summer grasses that are left over from last year, that's good. Um, it, it, if it was a solid clover paddock, I'd still be cautious. And okay, as Nigel and showed we're... you some great pictures, I, I'd be watching that. Sorry, Tani, cut you off. No, you're fine, Georgie. Um, just while we're on clover, uh, are there any varieties or particular varieties of, of clover that are safer than others? Oh. Uh, there, there's some claims of those that are safer. Um, 
I don't know how far to go with that because is that in a, a single sward or is that in a mixed pasture? Um, I think I would always still come back to, there is, there's some safer legumes they suggest, but as we said before, even grasses can give bloat. So I would be very careful on claiming that it's bloat proof. I've had a few and I'm still got some stock on some bloat proof past some clover. Um, we're testing the theory, so I'm not quite brave enough yet to say if it's bloat proof or not. They're worth too much money. Absolutely, at the moment they certainly are. And, and I would probably suggest at the moment that um, any form of, of prevention um, would be, be worth it at the moment. Um, <laughs> So I think not, so. And as Nigel alluded to before, it's not just bloat. I, I think we have to try and look for a pasture that makes sure we're, we're looking at all those issues rather than just bloat as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got another question here for you, Nigel. Um, this is from Nick. He finds that the larger animals, so in that 350 to 450 kilogram range, tend to bloat more. Um, and and why is that? Is that because they eat more, or is is there any particular reason that that might be yep. the case? Yep, I think that's 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 a hit, hit the nail pretty much on the head. I think you have to be a bit careful uh, that those animals which we are forcing on a very common problem is to get pulpy kidney clostridia at the same time. And there are cases, one of my colleagues, Andrew, um, on the Northern Tablelands here, uh, had a case where he thought he was dealing with some problems and he actually used the vaccine to treat the animals and they responded to the vaccine, even though he was losing some. It's a bit more complicated than that. But there's many discussions about whether the clostridia of pulpy kidney and others um, have an influence in the development of the bloat. So it is vitally important to make certain that, that you're giving your um, stock uh, ruminants, sheep, cattle, goats, uh, the five in one, at least a five in one, sometimes an eight in one, probably uh, as often as, as three months and in some of these high value animals, we often will, will make them make, suggest that they're vaccinated possibly every six weeks in high risk periods. Um, you asked me a moment ago about other prevention techniques. I, I believe that we, sh we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket. Um, we should look at the range of of blocks that could uh, be anti-bloat to, to provide some sort of oil to break down those bubbles. Um, there are oils that can go on to water if you've got reticulated water. Uh, there are oils that you can smear onto the cows. And I remember when I was a little lad, we used to hang bags of hessian up for our dairy cows to rub up against so that then they would be covered and they would lick themselves and other animals would lick them for the oil so that they were getting some oil in. Obviously, if you're if you're using dams, it's much more problematical. Um, th there are mechanisms where you can strip graze animals in really high risk pastures. So put an electric fence across, make certain that they've got going to eat not just the juicy fermented stuff, but the high fiber stalks on some of these brassicas. Um, and and also um, you can, if you're doing that strip grazing, you can use a backpack spray or whatever to, to spray some oils onto the pasture uh, so that with hopefully with every mouthful they're going to to get some of that oil in that we used to have these some um, you know bullet things that 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 um, bombs i think they were called that that, that 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 would release the oils in the belly but they're no longer available and and in some cases um where animals are really being pushed that category that you asked me about uh, you can use something like a menensin rumensin in there uh, which is has an activity against some of those microbes that, that will pro be producing the the, the gas um, you that's the prevention um, and really you don't have much time you can get cows dead within half an hour of putting them onto a pasture if it's really bad and uh, they don't just dry one at a time you're going to get 
lot crook at the same time. So uh, you've got to look at your management practices. Uh, where's the water in relation to the licks, etc. Juggling all these things. I, I'm more than happy to have a word with any of our clients on on how they can personalise it for themselves. As are my my colleagues, uh, Andrew, Lisa, and, and Leanne in Armadale. So Nigel, just on on some preventions, there's a, there's a question come through. Rock salt doused with vegetable oil in drums. Is this a strategy to use? If it will get it into them, yes, it is. It is a mechanism to 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 get it in. I, I'm a firm believer, as as you may know, of 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 having salt out 365 days at high risk times. Yes, you can use the oil. I, I've had people that have tried. Uh, even mixing the stuff up with with molasses to make them more palatable. But yes, having it out there is a way. Um, uh, the, the, uh, we put up that reference on the um, uh, the DPI website, but basically um, they're talking about mineral oils and vegetables or vegetable oils and uh, the, the sorts of amounts. It's it's in this document here. The, the amounts that you're sort of talking about, um, you know, could be quarter to half a, a litre uh, of stuff. So we're talking a significant amount to 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 really break down that 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 mass of, of bloated bubbles in the belly. Okay, uh, and another one, Nigel, what is the best uh, home remedy if you find a goat or, or ruminant that you suspect has bloat? And is there any way you can determine how much time you have to treat a suspected um, okay. bloat? Yep. Um, if, goat? If, if, you, if you'd like to go to that last slide that I showed you there, which has got some pictures on of remedies, you, you've really got to tap the left top left flank of that beastie um, to find out just just so just here where all that cow is. That's where you tap to see how much distension it is. Whether you can play, you know, a, a, a tune with the drum or whether it's just a little bit swollen. So you can either drench some of those oils by by um, out of a bottle. You can. Um, pass a stomach tube down and deliver the oil that way. So that will avoid them choking on the oil. But I've put there three little mechanisms for that really urgent one. What happens with a bloat is that the pressure builds up and up and up and up, and it presses up against the, the blood vessels lining the, the cavity just under the spine, and it stops the blood flow. So the animals get panty, distressed, and and their heart is, is is, is pumping empty because the blood can't get back to the heart. So in really tight, severe cases, you may well have to put a trocar and cannula in, which is what I've got here on the right hand side, which is like a pea shooter with a round knife in the middle. And you stab into that fossa there between the pelvis and the last rib, and you point it back down towards the elbow on the, the other side. And, and that, when you take the, the round knife out, the gas will come out. You can suture it in place if need be, but, but that will let the gas out, or you can inject oil in through that tube to break down that, that those bubbles and get it out. The picture on the top, the red one, is the new style of cannula, but to be honest, I don't find that big enough diameter and the, the bubbles just won't come out. Sometimes when it's really severe, you have to use a knife. Uh, and I've put a picture of a knife in the bottom there, which is actually a knife, a jambeer from Yemen. Uh, but it's a nice wide blade. And, and this isn't a jambeer, but if I stab it in down into the, where, where are we? This way. If I stab it in and then turn the knife blade through 90 degrees, I'm making a much wider hole that will left will let the gas out and then when I when the gas is down and I can remove the knife back through 90 I've only got a small hole but it's done its job it's life-threatening but if you have to use your knife they're going to die if you don't thank you Nigel I don't think we've ever had a, a presenter that's um showing a knife in a webinar before so so we're doing it here first so thank you very much for that illustration right. but but that that uh that Eddie, is really Eddie good to time. actually 
actually show, you know, what needs to be done. Yep. So we, we're yep. getting close to, to time now. I'm mindful at, at, at 6.30. So uh, just, just one last question, uh, Nigel, and what's, I guess, the connection between bloat and other things that can cause sudden death in livestock? Oh, that's a major topic for another webinar. Uh, we're doing one, you, you'll remind people, but we're doing one on, on um, the, the clostridias as a killer. Um, anthrax is another one that we always think about. Um, that, that is a bacterial thing, absolutely, totally unrelated to, to diet. It'll get them whether they're, whether they're eating nuts or eating grass. Uh, and I did mention nitrates, nitrates. Uh, where these ra rapidly growing plants, George, you'll correct me, but, but, but I'm sure, but, but basically if the plants are growing well, their metabolism is functioning. If the sun goes out and the weather changes and it's cloudy for a few days, their metabolism, which is photosynthesis from the sun coming down, just shuts up shop. So you've got pathways of metabolism that suddenly stop and you've got a build up of these, these ingredients which are part way along the, the path, pathway, but they are poisonous and they kill the animals. So that's another one that is definitely around and about there and we need to distinguish it. And that's why all of us vets here are keen for, for doing post-mortems to, to actually get to the nub Anthrax is notifiable. It's, it's a trade limiting disease. And, and, and if we don't pick those up and it becomes endemic here, we're going to, uh, nobody will want our animals. And we're going to have to vaccinate all that sort of stuff, which we don't want to do. So, yeah, always think of the list. If anybody wants to, I've got a big long list of, of diseases that could cause it a uh, sudden death. And I'm more than happy to share the, the gory details with anybody. Thank you, Nigel. I'm, I'm sure you are. So we, we might wrap up there. So thank you very much, Georgie and Nigel, for joining me tonight uh, on the webinar. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, and that was a great segue, Nigel, into our next webinar, which will be next Tuesday night, uh, same time, six o'clock on clostridial diseases. So Nigel will be joining us again with some of our other other district vets. So we hope you can join us for that. But thank you very much for your attendance tonight. We hope you've uh, got some good information from that webinar. Uh, stay safe and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. There will be a, a survey, short survey pop up um, at, when you close this webinar window. So if you could take the time to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate that. So thank you again, uh, stay safe and good night. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.